everybody, and welcome to this final session. Uh, we have had loads and loads of questions from people at home and from you in the room as well. So whilst we have those, again, you also have the opportunity to raise your hand for this session. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our eminent panel of our experts this afternoon. Uh, we have Professor Tara Moore, Lyle Armstrong, who will be joining us online when I'm not up on the screen. There are you. Um, <laughs> we have Mr. Mr. Uh, Kamin Zhu, uh, Ms. Pa Professor Paula Stanger, Professor John Marshall, Dr. Elizabeth Graham, and Mr. Simon Keatley, who will act as our MC for the afternoon. Simon, across good, to hello. you. Good, very good afternoon. I hope you feel refreshed and ready for the fray. We've had a huge number of uh, questions. Um, uh, the th three of us haven't actually introduced ourselves properly. You know most of them. But, uh, but just to let you know who we are and who you're talking to, um, my name's Simon Keatley. I'm one of the trustees of Retina UK. I'm a jobbing ophthalmologist. These scientists and these very clever people here, I bow uh, to their superior knowledge. I know nothing about genes, um, so please treat us gently. Um, but uh, I do still uh, do lots of cataracts, I still inject lots of eyeballs, uh, and I have a great time. Um, <laughs> but, I'm not, but, I'm, but I'm not very clever. Um, so I'll pass you over to Liz. Hello, I'm Liz Graham, I'm one of the medical trustees. I'm now a retired consultant, but my main specialties was inflammation of the eye and neuro-ophthalmology, which is brains in the eye. So I was very familiar <coughs> with unusual diseases that caused a needed a lot of management and a lot of cooperation between different specialties and conducted quite a lot of clinical trials. But I'm also not a geneticist or a retinal specialist. John. Um, <clears throat> I'm John Marshall. I was one of the co-founders of the organization with Lynn Decanter and for many years was uh, chairman of the medical advisory board. The students refer to me as the Heinz Professor of Ophthalmology, <laughs> 57 varieties, uh, because he could never make up his mind. Um, I worked most of my early life on retina, hence my interest in uh, inherited retinal dystrophies, etc. And then I went on holiday in the cornea and developed laser eye surgery. So uh, I'm a mixed person, but I have a huge interest in this yeah. field and particular in gene therapy. Fantastic. Sorry, gene therapy, not Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Well, we, um, we, we've certainly had some exciting stuff today. It's been really, really very exciting as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I know there are a lot of questions. Um, so, uh, Kate, are you going to uh, supervise the questions? Yes, yeah, so I will uh, deal with all the questions we've got on cards and that have come in online, but you can, you're still, obviously, if you're in the room, you're very welcome to just raise your hand and one of my colleagues will um, bring a microphone to you um, and then, Simon, if you can decide who can answer. So, do you, would you like me to kick off? Cause we've, yeah, why we've don't you kick some, off? With, there was one question in. from this morning that I think we ought to answer. Yeah. Over so, there, is that right? So the question is, with so many genes involved in inherited sight loss, how do you decide which ones to focus research on and what drives decisions over allocating funding? That's one for Tara. Did you hear that? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it takes a person and a scientist and one kind of dedicated team to drive forward any initiative for any particular gene that causes the disease. If I could put it into the context of the corneal genes that we look at, I just happened to be lucky that there was a Korean-owned company who wanted to sponsor that study and wanted to be involved in that because there was such a high percentage or high prevalence of that particular mutation and that disease in Korea. So it sometimes works like that where there just happens to be a situation where a funding body or an industrial partner and as we heard earlier, we can only take it till a certain stage in academia. We can only do so much in university, provide a full portfolio of evidence and proof of concept, but then we need a company. So we obviously have to get an industrial partner or something that pushes that forward through the final very complex years that let it then progress and to be a first in man study. Does that help your question? Great. Um, I'm happy to have a little chat with you afterwards as well if you want to talk about Retina UK or something. Great. Um, have we got any questions in yeah, the room? Yeah, let's have some questions from the floor. Uh, over there, that man, gentleman in the white on the left. 
Have you got the microphone? Great. Hi there. Um, Hi. I've got, a, I think, what is probably a really simple question, probably a yes-no answer. Um, <laughs> we've been hearing about some really fantastic uh, advances in, uh, in this medical field. Uh, it seems very complicated, very high-tech. So does this mean we've completely given up on eye transplants? Is that something we don't even bother pursuing anymore? Because I, I never hear anything about eye transplants. Anymore. Yeah, sure. Paolo, that sounds like up for your street. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> That's I, very thought really I thought you'd enjoy that. Uh, <coughs> I certainly would welcome eye transplants. I'm a, I'm a surgeon myself. Uh, we are not there yet. So I think we are a bit far from eye transplants. The closest in an imaginary world we could be at the moment is from uh, photoreceptor transplantation. They are doing some in very interesting work at uh, John Hopkins in the US on photoreceptor transplantation. But it's important to remember that we are still at an animal model stage. We cannot transplant a whole eye. It's very, very difficult because you have to remember that you have to uh, reconnect, if I can say it like that, uh, very, very tiny capillaries and hundreds of them, uh, blood vessels, so you, the, 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 the transplanted uh, organ has blood supply again. You have to reconnect nerve cells, nerve endings, muscles, so it's, it would be a very, very complex surgery. The initial uh, uh, bionic eye surgeries that we were doing would take five hours, uh, then we drop down the, the, the duration to two and a half hours average. But uh, it would be significantly longer to do a, a full eye transplantation. I think at, and we have to also remember the issues with, uh, with the immune system and, uh, and rejection uh, of transplanted tissues and in need of immunosuppression. So, so it's quite a complex area. I'd just like to add um, the complexity of this. I guess everybody here has seen those guys in the manhole with either cables or all those different colored wires for your telephone. <laughs> yeah. The optic nerve has a million fibers in an area which is about one and a half millimeters in diameter. So just imagine poor old Paolo trying <laughs> to connect the million fibers. <laughs> Got the red one in the wrong place. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I'm seeing inverted. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Let's have another question from the floor. Sir, over there in the, in the black jacket. Thank you. Uh, many thanks for taking my question. Uh, this is actually with reference to a wonderful lecture uh, given by, I think, Dr. Lyle Armstrong in the area of uh, basically stem cell therapy. So what I understand is uh, basically, based on his research actually, it may be possible in the future, uh, basically to um, uh, uh, kind of use this uh, therapy uh, wherein the person does not know which faulty gene is causing the basic um, uh, RP issue there, because in my case, my genetic testing has not yet proved that. That's number one question. Number two is, uh, how far are we away from uh, basic human trials? Because I'm very interested in to take part in this trial. So if some uh, light can be thrown on that as to how many years it will take before this will be available for human trials, it will be wonderful. Many thanks. Thank you. Lyle, I can't see you. Did you hear that? Yeah, I, I, I got that. Thanks. Good. Um, so, you know, it, it's very, very difficult to answer a question of how far we are away from a human trial because at, at this point we are... We, we have undertaken animal experiments to show that the photoreceptor transplants work in mice, but for us to then take the, uh, the work of making a, a, an, invisible, an immune invisible cell and transplanting that in mice, that will be at least another two years before we can show that that works. And then there are so many um, regulatory hurdles we have to go through before we can take that into a human model. It's our aim to do that, but I, it's very, very difficult for me to give you a, 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 a statement to say that it will be five years or ten years. It, it will be of that order before we can, we can do human work. 
I may even be retired by the time that happens. Uh, yes, Lily with the Retina UK T-shirt. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, I have to say, um, very, very humbled to be here today. I have a question. Are there any trials for Usher's 2A? Um, now, the future, not too distant. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I've missed that. Yeah, any trials for Usher's 2A? Uh, Usher's, okay. Um, Tara. There are trials ongoing. Um, Editas, uh, an American-based company, have been working on it. Um, I think through no fault of their own, uh, they have probably been given a standard to reach that they were not able to reach in terms of visual outcomes. So when we try to do any clinical trial or clinical study, we're, have to, we're very much restricted by the FDA telling us here are the exact rules by which you must play this game. And I think the outcome measurements for the success of that trial, and that was for a CRISPR gene editing, and all their initial studies and their preliminary data showed it as a very favorable potential therapy. But they've just recently um, launched and completed their phase three stage of that trial, and they've had to pause because they failed to reach those outcomes of best corrected visual acuity, showing a significant improvement. And I think if we turn to any of the ophthalmologists here, depending on the time frame and on when you're recruited into that type of study and how much damage there already is, it's really difficult to meet an objective like that. But perhaps you'd like to touch on yeah. that from your experience. Um, yeah, I can tell you there's active research into ASHA 2A in, in Oxford right now. Um, it's in animal stage. We have a mouse model. We're investigating CRISPR, that type of approach. And as, as I'm sure, several labs around the world uh, it's an attractive target because there's a, obviously a large cohort of patients out there. Yeah. Uh, it is difficult because the gene is very large. So we have to do yeah. gene editing or that type of approach. Mm -hmm. um, but this technology is relatively new and it's progressing extremely fast in terms of the tools that's available in, in the CRISPR field. So it is, I think of, of the hundreds of mutations out there, it's actually one of the top few that our people are looking at. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, do you want to add something? Yeah. Um, just so that everybody understands, um, the Food and Drug Administration in America is seen as the gold standard for all medical um, treatments. And it has two criteria. The first one is efficacy. It has to be effective. And the second one is safety. So no one wants to stop uh, monitoring in that way. The big problem is that uh, since 2007, their bureaucracy has increased 80%, and they now have a budget of $6.7 billion to do this regulatory issue. And it takes a long time. I mean, for the laser, from the idea to FDA approval was 10 years. And many companies, startup companies actually go bust because of the length of time. So please be patient. The laboratory workers are moving incredibly quickly with some brilliant ideas. But at the end of those brilliant ideas, as we said earlier, in order to get a treatment out there in the, in the world, we need links to a company. And when we do that, we have to go through the regulatory approval. Tara and I have spent several weeks and we have a big meeting with the FDA on Monday, different area, but it is a long, rigorous process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, there's a question, I think, on the, the uh, back left. Uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in one of the talks earlier, it, it was mentioned that um, you need to use immunosuppressant techniques um, to, to maintain the, um, the, the increase in vision. So my question is, um, for those techniques that repair the retina uh, rather than preserve the retina, is it always going to be necessary to have immune system suppressing drugs? Or for, for the stem cells, I thought 
because it comes from your own genes, it wouldn't need that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a very nice question. Um, Liz, you're, you've dealt with um, immunosuppression in lots of other eye diseases. Do you want to just start with that? Well, yes, I think initially, certainly as this research took off, the main problem that people found was that um, patients were developing a nasty immune response and the steroids and so on required to treat that were affected, but they also gave side effects. But as things have been honed better, the chance of the inflammation has come down. And Dr. Shree, you're probably in a better position uh, yeah, for the happy, present I'm happy situation. to try to answer that. I think currently, yes, you need some form of immunosuppression. It, we're not talking about vast amounts where your whole immune system is shut down so that you're susceptible to infection. The type of immune suppression that's been used in these treatments so far are relatively mild, yeah. uh, well tolerated, especially if you're young and fit. Um, but perhaps if you're talking about cells transplant for macular degeneration where the patient population are elderly and perhaps have other medical issues, that will be more of an important factor. Yeah. But if I, can, if I can just add, the, the topic of, uh, of, of my presentation was that we will be able to generate cells that the immune system can't detect so they would be transplantable into any patient without the need for immune suppression. I think it is, uh, I, <clears throat> I agree with everything my, uh, the, the other speakers have said. I think it's important to differentiate gene therapy from uh, stem cell treatment. Yeah. In gene therapy, we are not, you know, I've been doing gene therapy for uh, almost 10 years now, and we do not, as part of clinical trials, of course, there's, there's no, uh, um, so, but, in gene therapy, we are, we are uh, doing uh, periocular steroid injection at the end of a surgery, and we are doing a topical steroid application, anti topical anti-inflammatories, drops. We are not doing systemic anti-inflammatories any longer. Uh, for stem cells, and we are looking into being part of a stem cell trial early next year, we are going to have to use immunosuppression. So as, 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 uh, as, you've, as other speakers have mentioned before, this can be a potential problem for uh, patients over a certain age and with other medical conditions. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that all these um, uh, therapies that we've heard about will have, will have problems and side effects, and uh, certainly um, long-term steroids do have quite a lot of side effects, which we try and avoid. Okay, um, any, any more questions from the floor? Sir, yes. Can we have a microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the treatment for um, macular degeneration and uh, the fovea for people with retinitis pigmentosa, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Armstrong was saying that that's, that's much the same. Most of my... Uh, rods have died, so I've, it's got to the stage now where it's really the phobia which has been affected. And I'm thinking because of the amount of people who have macular degeneration, could that not be pushed forward quicker, um, due, similar to the coronavirus, due to the sheer no numbers of people with uh, macular uh, de degeneration, uh, which is much more prevalent than people with RP. Uh, and it's, and it, as, I, as, I, as I grasp it, that, that the treatment was a kind of cover all for macular degeneration and uh, people yeah. with damage yeah. to the phobia. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Hello, probably. Yeah, that's, that's <coughs> we fully, fully agree with you. It's, thank you for bringing it up. Macular degeneration is a very common condition and uh, we do need a lot of investment and research in this area. Fortunately, there is. Uh, there's a lot of research going on. Uh, we at the Retina Clinic London, we've got, we, we are doing gene therapy studies in, uh, we are part of gene therapy trials in, in geographic atrophy w through surgery and now we are starting one with Janssen with a single intravitreal injection of uh, gene therapy. So rather than subretinal injection through surgery, this will be injection, intravitreal injection. This is in dry, advanced dry AMD. 
We have other studies, and others, of course, have other studies as well in wet AMD, also gene therapy, intravitreal injections of, uh, of gene therapy. So there's, there's a lot, a lot of research going on. We have to remember that we are now in dry AMD, where we were with wet AMD about 20 years ago. We're just starting with this, these mm -hmm. therapies. Now we have new therapies like uh, farisimab, with which 50% uh, of patients can have intervals of four months between injections in wet AMD. So there's plenty of option, and if we catch, if we diagnose and start treating uh, wet AMD early enough, people maintain good reading vision or reading vision throughout their whole life. It's a question of early diagnosis and access to, to treatment. And I have, personally, I have no doubts that we'll reach the same stage with uh, with dry AMD, we are we are we are we are there, as as Professor Marshall I think said, and and well Tara said, uh, we need a lot of investment. It's essential to have uh, investment from industry. There's there's no other way. Uh, without and uh, collaboration with industry, we have to uh, we have to lose the fear of working with industry because there's no other way. John. What's very important, it, it's a little bit unfortunate that we have uh, Retina UK and we also have the Macular yeah. Disease Society, when in reality, uh, the lessons learned in either of the two groups are lessons that we all share. Sure. And this is really platform technology and that's very, interest uh, very interesting for companies because it's very difficult to develop a company to treat a single disease, but if you understand how photoreceptor cells die or how you can save them, then that becomes across the board and may affect lots of different diseases. One thing I should add is that many diseases are caused by genes which have an effect in a single cell. So there are diseases in which the gene is expressed in cones, and there are diseases in which the gene is expressed in rods. But if you lose sufficient number of cells, then you change the environment, and a rod disease may end up with killing the cones because you've changed the environment, and vice versa. So you're absolutely right. We've got to work together, and indeed the scientists are all working together on this, to address the whole issue of survival and protection of light-sensitive cells, regardless whether these are rods or cones, or whether it's central or peripheral. We're learning from each other, and you raised a very good point there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that point. I, I think it's it, perhaps <coughs> important to remember that there is an approach called optogenetics. Yep. We've talked a lot yep. about yep. specific mutations and treatment for those specific mutations, but as all the other speakers have very eloquently explained, it, it is very difficult because you have hundreds of mutations. Yeah, I think, I think we've got a question on optogenetics from, from uh, the floor, haven't we, uh, Kate? We have. Uh, I just need to find it because that's not the one. I'm, I'm <laughs> conscious that uh, we're not we're ignoring the people online, and uh, we need some questions from them. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll find that optogenetics question. Sorry. But in the meantime, <laughs> um, what role can diet play in slowing down the deterioration caused by RP, and what research, if any, has been carried out in that area? Yeah, well, an interesting question. Who wants to take that on? Go on, John. You, you. Well, um, <laughs> diet is uh, not something I can concern. No. <laughs> Uh, the only thing um, taking vitamins ever did for me was it cleared my ear problem, i.e. my wife saying, have you taken your vitamin pills? <laughs> so I, the, the Americans did a study on um, age-related macular degeneration, the so-called ARED study, in which mm. patients took a whole cocktail of supplementaries, and a lot of people take that in the U.S., where it's private medicine and they pay for it f for themselves, uh, it hasn't really been adopted by the NHS because the premise of the original study was we were going to get a change in the uh, behavior of rod cells. In reality, there was no change in behavior of rod cells with the ARES study, 
and just a slight change in the electrophysiology, the electrical responses from cone cells. So if, if you're going to take vitamins or any dietary uh, supplements or dietary exclusions, you really should be aware that the excess of some vitamins are not good. Yeah. And there were early studies showing excess of vitamin E and vitamin A in the early days did lead to accelerated degeneration of retina in rats with a form of inherited retinal dystrophy. So I think Simon and I are a great example of dietary non-control. Exactly. <laughs> I think a large amount of red wine is very good for you. <laughs> A small observation, this is not human data, but in the mouse model of rhodopsin-related autosomal dominant RP, uh, when you put the mouse in dim red light filter cage, compared with a normal full bright light, um, the, the degeneration is significantly slower in the, the mouse that's lived and grown in a red cage. So perhaps the blue end of the wave spectrum is more damaging or triggers more toxicity in the retina. But that is only an animal study. I don't know how you would translate that to human. Can't imagine wearing red goggles all the time. Um, so, but there are some some factors that are at play. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I hope that helps. Yes, Kate. Yes, I found the optogenetics. You found the optogenetics, <laughs> which was as simple as uh, could somebody explain exactly what stage uh, trials are at now with optogenetics? Okay. Well, Pilo, that's your your bag, isn't it? Uh, we've, there's a lot of, there was a lot of talk today uh, uh, from all the other speakers about mutations and treatments for genetic, genetic gene therapy for gen specific mutations. But as they explained very clearly, uh, there are hundreds of mutations, so you would need hundreds of different genetic approaches. Uh, so optogenetics tries to be uh, agnostic, tries to uh, be an, a treatment that's independent of what mutation you have and aims at uh, tricking uh, residual retinal cells at be believing that they are photoreceptors so that they capture uh, light. Uh, there, is, uh, there is very interesting research ongoing. Uh, it's a company called uh, Nanotherapeutics that seems to be uh, the closest to having anything that could become commercially available. And that is in, uh, in star guards and uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, that is very exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Does anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, there's actually a trial that published an early result from uh, Pittsburgh. That shows us a health group, I think it's two years ago now. So they've actually tried optogenetics in, in human patients and they're getting some early and promising results. Yeah, yeah. good job. I think the, there was a problem in the early days because um, the retina is very complicated and you've got light sensitive cells and then connecting to those are things called bipolar cells which take the information to the ganglion cells which go back to the brain. And then there are two cells like one octopus is one way up and one the octopus is the other way up and they're called horizontal cells and uh, amacrine cells. And in the earliest trials, the, the labeling, the thing that made them sensitive to light, went to those two octopuses. And, and they weren't very effective because they are quite large cells uh, and they couldn't in any way duplicate what the rods and cones do. So the more recent work, and there's an American worker, John Flannery, um, he's used optogenetics to couple the light sensitive pigments into the bipolar cells and in the central area of retina there's almost a one to one light sensitive cell to bipolar and that's showing much more promise now um, and uh, especially using a new green base rhodopsin pigment and I think that holds tremendous promise for the future. Brilliant. Exciting stuff. A uh, gentleman in the black T-shirt had a hand up. I can't ignore you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your opportunity. Uh, I really like to know about the treatment in Germany, uh, Berlin. Uh, it's a clinic which is Federal Restore Vision Clinic. Uh, is it true? Uh, can they really treat our condition? 
I appreciate your answer. Thanks. Sorry, which, which condition were we talking about? Oh, Retinia is pigmentosa. Okay, generally, not really. If you want to listen to our recent podcast, actually, uh, Retina UK did a podcast with the present uh, presenter of uh, the BBC documentary Blind Faith. There's a little bit more information in there about clinics like Fedorov, um, and I can speak to you afterwards as well if you like. Right, that's Blind Faith, and that can be on that's on YouTube, isn't it? Now? Oh, so this is something that we do not recommend. Which I think. Yeah. I think, um, again, I think. Those of you that have been in the organisation for some time know that over the last 50 years, there have been countless treatments yeah. for RP. Uh, you know, people went to Russia to have uh, NCAD or ultrasound. People went to Italy to have hyperbaric oxygen. They went to Cuba to have Leotril extract from apricots. They went to America to have evangelical counselling. Unfortunately, none of them have stood the test of time, and that's why this organization tries to give you hard science, and what the group here of experts are going to give you, they're not going to tell lies, fairy stories, they're actually going to sell you as it is, and that's why organizations like the FDA are needed to make sure that patients don't spend a huge amount of money and go all over the world for fake quack treatments. I have to say, the worst one of all was in Bromley, in this country, and that was bee stings in the eye by a lady that claimed she fed her bees on very special honey, which cured RP. I, I think it is, yeah, I think it is very important to be very careful because regulations in the continent are completely different to, to the UK. Uh, I remember, traveling to uh, Russia for the first time in 1993, six months after they opened the borders, and uh, to see what treatments they were doing for RP, they were doing magnetotherapy, they were doing uh, translocation of the temporal artery, and, uh, and at Cuba they were doing the same, same kind of treatments. And people have spent fortunes uh, trying going to these places, uh, especially Cuba, and I don't remember seeing anybody that's come back with a successful outcome. And they wouldn't publish in, in peer-reviewed literature, which is what we all do here. So we, we, we all, all, all of us here on the podium are a part of international trials. These are very well-regulated clinical trials uh, that have gone through a, a very uh, strict uh, process for approvals. So we need to be very careful. We, we, we all can only, as Professor Marcia said, we only recommend uh, trials where there is some science to back them up. Yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? I hope it does. Okay, good. Uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Daniel. Nice to meet you all. Um, I've got a couple questions. First of all, going back to the optogenetics, do you know how many times the, um, the procedure can potentially be done and how long it would last for is my first question. And my second question is, when it comes to all these different treatments, how far are they away? And the ones I've got in mind is, you know, the stem cell stuff that can grow new rods and cones, the, the eye implant, you know, when would that, a sophisticated version of that be available, do you think? Something, I'm thinking bionic eye, six million dollar man. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've got the RP, sorry, this is a lot of questions. I've got the RPGR gene. When I investigated gene therapy years back, they said that it was for people at an earlier stage of the condition. When would something be available, do you think? for people at a later stage of the condition, like myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Do you want to answer the, uh, well, the, the number of questions? The, I think the, RP, the last <laughs> question, um, RPGR, I mean, you're, you should really uh, join one of these genetics clinics where we do gene therapy trials and measure the amount of function you have left because you may be eligible for the, one of these current clinical trials for gene therapy. 
Uh, in terms of optogenetics, the, the ones in trials are delivered using gene therapy methods, so very similar to gene therapy using a viral particle. So it's meant to be once treated uh, and long-term expression of the protein, which is light sensitive. Um, the other interesting question yeah, about I, Latin I, implants. I, I agree. The optogenetic trials are ongoing at the moment. So uh, we need more time to know what the results are going to be. Preliminary results being presented uh, seem to be very encouraging, but you know, we've been there before where you have initial results that are encouraging and the long-term treatments don't work. So we need to be careful, we need to wait, we need, we need the clinical trials to, to, to be completed. Uh, with regards to a bionic eye, like six million dollar man with a, a six times zoom and infrared vision and everything Steve Austin had, which I remember very well from, from the 70s when I would watch it, and my dad would say, why are you watching that, that silly program? Uh, <laughs> I think we are far away. Yeah, patience is a virtue, I'm afraid, and that's a lot of, we, we don't have patience. But, but remember, who would have thought we'd all have these things in our pocket with 10 times the computing capacity yep. of Apollo 13, yep. Yep. and on Star Wars, click, beam us up, spotty, click. So things are accelerating the whole time. And, and just as a follow-up to your optogenetics, you ask absolutely the right question, how long is it gonna take? Because in your eye, uh, the rods, uh, when light comes in like it is through the window at the moment, the rods get bleached, and the bleach products go to the pigment epithelium are reassembled and passed back at night. So the retina works harder in the dark than in the light. And that's one of the problems at the moment with the optogenetics, getting the cycle to work. We can get the pigment into cells, but now we've got to concentrate on getting the cycle to work and making it last. So great question, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, I, have we got some more questions from the virtual audience? Um, yeah, there was a, a question um, actually about going back to immunosuppression. Um, are there implications for people who have had a transplant and are already immunosuppressed? Is there Liz. any crossover? That's actually quite interesting. I, I wonder if um, yeah. their retinal degeneration slows down even with immunosuppression because there is a theory that there's some low-grade inflammation happening in the retina as cells are dying that is driving the disease. That's one of the factors. Um, and if you're already on immunosuppression, then of course, um, that's already sufficient for yeah. gene therapy. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really I, interesting I mean, that's a rare scenario. Yeah. It'd be very interesting to see what this patient is yeah. doing. Yeah, it'd be very interesting. Okay. Any more, Kate, from you? There are more from me, if, yeah. there's, if uh, there's nobody yeah. in the room. Well, so, let's, um, let's, yeah, let's do a few more from Okay. The, our daughter has RP. My wife, uh, my daughter and I were all at Moorfield some years ago for genetic testing. However, the result of the testing did not uh, produce the result. Um, this was sometime in 2015. Has there been any further development in testing since then? Do you want to do that? Yeah, there are complex diseases and obviously some things that are not just monogenetic and not just totally related, one gene, one mutation. And, and a set of symptoms that are characterized. There are some diseases we haven't discovered yet. So it's all about patients like this presenting to the clinic, access to their DNA, and us continually trying to run diagnostics on them and trying to compile all that data. Artificial intelligence comes into that, where we're able to take a look at patterns and take a look at DNA sequences and identify new genetic mutations. But as, as was mentioned earlier, not, not everything, can, I think you said 50%, yeah, 50%. Uh, they can't actually pinpoint a mutation to, if you want and to this, add. This proportion is increasing because I know mm -hmm. several groups have done studies using latest transcriptomic data to analyze more deeply the, the DNA sequence. So the easy ones to detect are the ones in the exons which code protein. But that actually only constitutes about a few percent of the entire genome. And so actually most of that genome, so-called junk DNA, that we don't know what it's doing or code for, a lot of mutations are in those regions, and those regions control the gene. They don't directly code for things, but they tell you when to switch on and when to switch off the gene. And so increasingly, we are able to identify some of those in those intronic regions. 
So that proportion is going up steadily. So perhaps it's worth revisiting that DNA sequence um, at some point. 99% of your genome does not code for actual genes, only like 1% to 2%. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of information that we don't know why it's there. It's there obviously for survival and to, it has a regulatory or there's lots of different methylations and modifications that happen that we don't entirely understand. Yeah. AI? Yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, I'm, I'm constant. I, uh, I keep forgetting Lyle, and I do apologise, Lyle, because uh, I can't see you. So, no if worries. you want to interrupt, please. Uh, we have a question for Lyle question already. For Lyle. <laughs> Come on, Lyle. <laughs> You're sitting there being mute, and uh, let's hear some. Would knowledge. the Professor Armstrong's stem cell work be as applicable for RP um, and conditions that affect a wider area of the retina as well as the macula, and the treatments seem to be aimed at late stage disease. What reasonable level of site recovery is being aimed for? I, I have to say at the present time that the, the site recovery in the animal models is relatively modest. Uh, when we look at the electrical signals that the, the, the retinas in those animals are generating, it's nowhere near complete recovery of vision. Oh, please don't fall off your seat. <laughs> Um, so, obviously, we would aim to get as much as we possibly can. But at this stage, before we get into, into human trials, that's, that's a really difficult question to answer as best as we can. That, that, that's all I can say at this stage. Retinal transplant or retinal progenitor cells. And I think the concept there is not just to actually get these cells to wire up and provide vision, but actually they secrete factors that rescue the survival of surrounding cells, which were already mentioned. Yeah. So these cells may have some other additional benefit in, in people with final bit of degeneration affecting the cones. Maybe we can provide the factors that keep the cones alive. Yeah. That's, that, that's absolutely true. And of course, that's something that in the mouse model that we're using, we can't really do that because they don't have any photoreceptors anyway. So that's a question that's really impossible to answer until we get into human trial. Okay. Any more questions from the floor here? Yes, it's a lady here at the front. Oh. Here we go. Thank you. Hiya. Um, so my partner has already had his kind of gene mutation. You found out what it is, haven't you? Com confirms what it is. So for the kind of gene therapy, how would we kind of progress with that if we wanted to see if he's eligible for it with his mutation? Do you want to answer that? Well, um, which clinic do you go to? Just out of interest. Okay, yeah. I think if you have your local ocular geneticist uh, who will be reasonably well connected with the gene therapy world, then they will know which genes are currently in clinical trial. The, the big ones at the moment are RPGR, Chloridremia. Um, the, the other genes that people are working on, rhodopsin, uh, ushers, so it's good to, be, to make yourself known because there are groups building up databases of patients, for example, in Moorfields, in Oxford, Manchester. These are the major genetic eye disease centers in the UK. Uh, I'm not so sure about Ireland, but perhaps Tara could advise. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so one of these centers will, will be good to get in touch, perhaps, um, if you have a gene, a known mutation. Okay. There's a question over there, yeah. I've got a, yeah. Um, just a question out of curiosity. Um, think about where someone has a condition or is eligible for a trial or treatment. If they, as an informed decision for them, if they're thinking, yep, I'll go and proceed with that, as we know, technology changes, and something in the future comes about, is that a one opportunity they get, or can they have a, a therapeutic that comes out in the future, again, as a second or third, or how many needs? Uh, does that make sense? If you're already part of a trial, could you be retreated once the treatment is approved? I think yes. It doesn't preclude you from having an approved treatment. But if you're having already had a treatment, you may be excluded from another clinical trial where they want a fresh patient. So 
So I don't think it's going to be detrimental to receiving an approved treatment, for sure. And, and I think it's, it's worth remembering, if you're lucky and the disease is caught early for a particular treatment regime, terrific. But then if you've lost photoreceptor cells and that didn't work, there are other treatments of different types. So if you have gene therapy, let's say, early on, and then perhaps you could try some stem cells, etc. I'm being hypothetical, and if that didn't work in later stage where you've lost almost all the retina, uh, you could begin to look at the bionic treatment regime. So you, you have to think of a spectrum of treatment which is available at different times in the disease process. And we're very lucky at the moment, these are all developing, and the uh, retina UK has invested in many of these different types. So um, you're with a good group. Keep reading the newsletter. Yeah, absolutely. Kate, some more questions from the, from the uh, virtual world? Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, cool. Is there still, um, what are the current trends in research? Um, is there a focus on treatments that can treat a range of genetic causes? So we have heard a little bit about this. Is there a, still any merit in researching single gene causes? Well, Tara, why don't you take that? What was that? The final part of that question. Is there, is there, any, is there any point in, in, in um, uh, investigating single gene? Causes. Is there still any merit in pursuing sort of single gene focused research? Yeah, definitely. I think those are the ones that are the easiest to be successful in. Not necessarily that it's easy at any stage of the process. Um, in terms of where the focus is or maybe, I think delivery and perhaps some of the failures in gene replacement and in some of the other gene therapies have been down to the fact we just cannot get enough delivered in there. It's not that it doesn't work and work particularly well. It's very, very difficult to get enough of it in there and get it surviving, whether you're replacing a gene or whether you're putting a target in to cut a gene or edit a gene. And as mentioned, viruses are used a lot for that and they're not ideal. Um, so if some of these very larger entities that are therapeutic can be delivered by other methods, you may even mitigate the need for steroids because I think we've maybe lost the fact that it is a virus, even though it's a modified virus, it's often that that is evoking the immune response. And we're all here today because we have an immune response that stops something like COVID killing us. So I think to come back to that, one element of the immune response and the need for steroids is due to perhaps using viruses or alien proteins that are going into your body or alien genes. So any kind of delivery that prevents us having to use viral-like particles or any delivery that gives us a better level of gene being replaced or the therapeutic scissors being the higher amount of it will make the therapy more successful. So. Yeah. Definitely single gene mutations, it's where I work and where I hope we'll have success. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the, the, gene, thera the gene trial you're involved in at the moment it involves nanotechnology as a delivery system, which is using silicon particles, um, which are quite benign. Yeah, and quite novel in that it's maybe probably the first topical delivery where we can deliver that topically and, and whilst I'm doing that to the front of the eye to deliver to the front of the eye we have some mass spec imaging that shows that's equally able to deliver into the back of the eye in the retina but we have to take baby steps and we have to start with something that's easier and it's easier to do a single gene a single mutation a very obvious disease symptom in the front of the eye and hopefully then in time that will lead the way and, and open the door for people then to come along and do similar projects in the retina for the more complex diseases. Wouldn't it be great to just put a drop in your eye and cure your vision? That would be nice. <laughs> um, any, question, any more questions from the floor? We're running out of time with another five minutes. Kate, got some more? Oh, Professor Marshall's falling off his chair. <laughs> Chairs they're not. They're not very comfortable. Precarious. They're not very comfortable. I'm scared to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're absolutely. much more stable with the gin and tonic. In <laughs> 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 and Bring red, in the gin. Yeah, red wine. Um, Kate, 
does the Orion cortex chip that Professor Stanger mentioned um, bypass the eye completely? Does it rely on any light perception <coughs> in the eye itself still? Uh, thank, you thank you for the question. Yes, it does. The, the, the whole idea is that it does bypass the eye completely. We have to remember that uh, what, what's called so far the bionic eye, the, the, all the other implants require a functioning optic nerve so that, you know, if you have glaucoma, if you have uh, ischemic vein occlusion, if you have diabetic, advanced diabetic retinopathy, any uh, ischemic retinal disease, any damage of the optic nerve, uh, those uh, retinal detachment, uh, though the, the bionic eye does not work because you have no, nothing to transfer the information from the eye to the brain. So the idea of developing the orio uh, in, in cortical implant is that you are bypassing uh, all of the visual pathway. You're going directly uh, into the brain. Thank you. There was a lady here with a, uh, uh, with a beautiful guide dog who wants to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I've got um, two questions. One is, my daughter is a student of psychology um, and really wants to uh, do research sort of with psychology, neurology, to do with sight loss. Um, so is there a particular um, place or person that it would be good for her to contact? And my second question is, if you had a million pounds to invest in one of the things to do with RP, what would you invest in? Yeah, that's an interesting question, isn't it? First, first, first question first, I mean, probably Retina Ret UK will be able to provide a, uh, a contact. Then Matt's putting his thumbs up. So go and talk to, to, to Matt at the end. Um, not a bad question. If you all had a million pounds, that's not very much, sadly, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> where do you think, where, where do you think the, the final solution for... RP and, and inherited retinal disease lie. Tara? I think the problem is that a million pounds is a drop in the ocean, yeah, and exactly. unfortunately, so many companies are spending hundreds of millions, so, yeah, yeah. it's so costly, but others may have other opinions. One, one clinical trial with the FDA costs 70 million, yeah, exactly. just, just as a trial. Pound could keep my research group going for a few years. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Good. Um, are we done? We go. Well, you've got some more questions. Fantastic. Kate? Um, okay. Um, you talked about uh, catching mutations early. Um, is it likely? that it would be possible to detect a gene mutation during pregnancy, and could anything be done even as early as that? Yeah, interesting question. Yeah, huge ethical implications. Yeah, um, not naming any countries, there may be places that that is happening in, and there may be some practice of attempting to gene edit at the embryo stage. Um, look, uh, as was mentioned, there's huge implications here for off targets, and. You know, we're trying our best with the FDA and with all experiments we do to only have on-target effects and not possibly target anywhere else that could maybe damage multiple other genes and multiple other organs. But yeah, there's potential for that. And we want yeah, to add currently, to it. there's not legal to em edit embryonic, uh, or to do with patients or infants, but you can edit cells that are already fully developed in an organ. So the eye is a good organ to try gene editing. That's why Editask is one of the first companies to have already tried it. Um, but they are interested now in other diseases that are more have uh, like hemophilia and other things where there are more patients. Um, but still, I think there's a lot of interest and potential for gene editing in the eye because it's a limited organ, relatively limited off targets. And, and just remember with the increase in artificial intelligence, which frightens some but not others, and the cross-coupling with robotics, um, surgery is becoming much more precise, and some surgery is now undertaken on the child in the womb, and the beauty there is that there's virtually no scarring if you treat early enough. I'm not saying that's the case for the eye, but I am saying that question 
is a question that isn't a as far away as many of us would have thought because things are really moving at a rate that is really quite frightening for some of us. I mean, for example, like stern gene therapy is done in children already and then some of them are quite young yeah. um, and they're getting good results. So perhaps if you rescue the cells early, you can preserve the vision for longer. Yeah. Um, so there may be a point to earlier intervention. Any other questions from the floor? You're all completely zonked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last question. I think we did touch on this a little bit earlier, but the background to this question is actually the ProQR uh, suspensions that happened last year, where um, the, author the regulatory authorities weren't satisfied with the endpoints that the companies were using. But what progress is being made to establish better endpoints and better measures for clinical trials that will reflect disease outcomes and satisfy the regulators. Who wants to do that one? Look, you might have to stop, John, after an hour. <laughs> 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 I do have a flight to get. <laughs> the the, the endpoint situation is just so difficult. <laughs> and the FDA are very clever because they ask the research workers to decide the endpoint. And then when the research workers can't deliver the endpoint, the FDA tell us off. Um, it would be really nice if the regulators could set endpoints in some of the areas, and that would speed things up. But endpoints are so difficult, they're disease and process and treatment dependent. Um, and, uh, well, what more can I say? It's difficult. Nothing, I don't think, because yeah. that's the end. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> to also educate the regulators about the IRDs because Impossible. there's a very unique type yeah. of disease. Yeah. It's not the same as AMD and others or glaucoma. Uh, you're not expecting a huge improvement, so you're re really looking for preservation. So these endpoints need to be negotiated very carefully. Mm. Then we have to be more proactive. They want visual acuity. Yeah. They, they always want visual acuity. That, but it's not a good endpoint. No, you know. absolutely hopeless endpoint. I'm going to end it there, guys. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and your fantastic questions. I've learnt a huge amount, actually. Um, and uh, I would very much like to show you um, our appreciation for these fantastic experts next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>